but uh, we'll try and go through the program as well as possible. As we start, can I ask uh, Esther Nganga to pray for us? Let us pray. Ah, dear Heavenly Father, we have come before your presence with thanksgiving and with praise because of who you are. You are our God. You are the creator of the universe and all therein. We thank you for the opportunity to have this uh, Innovation Week. We thank you for all our visitors that are here with us and even those that may be joining us later. Uh, we thank you for according them the opportunity and the time to be with us. I thank you for each one of us at the university for being here. Uh, we just want to bless your name. Thank you, Father, for the work that has gone into the planning of this day. And we are grateful that indeed it is coming to pass even for the next three days. So, Father, as we sit to discuss various things concerning innovation, we want to thank you for the minds that you have given many of us to be able to come up with the solutions that will aid the problems that we have as a society. So Father, we commit everything into your hands. We pray that you will guide us. We pray for your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as we move on from today till the end of this session. We bless you and we exalt you. In Jesus' name we do pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, Colleagues, we are very late. Like I said, we were supposed to start in the morning. We are starting in the afternoon. We are starting actually when we are supposed to end. That means that we are already very primed and therefore we shall be able to do what we are supposed to do with the speed that we need. I'm privy to the fact that some of our visitors are very busy people and some of them go to three, four meetings in a day. So we should appreciate that and move our program as fast as possible. All of us are aware that uh, this is actually a dialogue. A dialogue. We are going to dialogue on fost fostering collaborations between the universities and the private sector. It's not just the private sector that we collaborate with, we also have the public sector here being represented by the county government. And so I do not want to waste time. Um, I want to call uh, the director of research to come and say one or two things and invite the, the DVC planning, research, and extension, who will welcome our guests here, and then we'll proceed from there. So, Lizzie Karibu. Thank you so much, MC. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I just want to welcome you today to today's session. This is the first uh, day for our Innovation Week, and we are starting with uh, the fostering of collaborations between universities and private and public sectors. This session has been uh, sponsored by uh, UK Innovate and uh, they are going to introduce themselves. They are here today. And also uh, tomorrow we have the official opening our, of our Innovation Week and uh, this session is going to be officially opened by our own Vice Chancellor so we welcome you to tomorrow and on Wednesday we have our public lecture. So uh, with those few remarks, I would like to welcome our Deputy Vice Chancellor, uh, Planning, Research and Extension to introduce the guests and officially open this session. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. When I, uh, you know, you need to be obedient. I said good morning. I didn't say good afternoon. <laughs> you 
It was very intentional. Good morning, everybody. Ah, then you are clever. <laughs> okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are so happy to have you here, all our guests and all the participants. Uh, this is a um, function that we really valued so much and we really wanted uh, a lot of time. We were thinking of at least six hours. But though we are late, we just want to uh, request, I know as the, uh, our dear brother, Professor Chudo has said, uh, our guests are very busy and they have really dedicated their time to be here. And so uh, let us um, just request them, please, that you extend slightly a bit so that we can be able to have uh, all that we needed to have. Next time you come, we are not going to misbehave like this. We're going to start in time <laughs> so that we don't waste your time for other activities. Uh, to start, I think um, I would like uh, our guests just to introduce themselves individually. We'll start from the far end. Uh, just introduce yourself from where you are coming, your name and where you are coming from. And uh, maybe the other details will come later. So let's start with uh, the lady. So. They are not working? Okay. Uh, just put it on. Professor Kitainge, how could the whole... Oh, uh, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was going to... <laughs> this is the guy who is representing us in that team that the president appointed on education. I was saying, how could he let us down? And he's our educationist. We donated to the president. Please. Okay. It's good that he has... Uh, yeah, my name is Esther Chero. I work for Kenya Seed Company as a branch manager here in Eldred, representing uh, the management of Kenya Seed in this special conversation uh, meeting. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Bishar Ali. Uh, I come from Absa Bank, Eldoret, and I'm the branch manager. And I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Yulita Mitei Chiriot, Deputy Governor Nandi. I represent the public sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tari. Those who don't know, Dr. Tari, this is one of our own from the Department of Chemistry on donation to, Na <laughs> to Nandi County. And she did so well that those people couldn't afford. Uh, she, they had to be appointed on the second term. I don't know how many governors have been appointed on the second term. Very rare. So we are happy with the products. God bless you. Karibu. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, my name is Julia Songok. I'm from APSA Bank. I'm the regional manager supporting Rift and Western Cluster. Happy to be here today. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chepke Moy Magdalene. I'm the founder and the executive director at Eldo Hub, a tech and innovation hub which is based here in Eldoret. But I'm also the chairperson of the Association of Countrywide Innovation Hubs, a, net a network which brings together all innovation hubs across the country. Thank you. Thank you so much. One of our own. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sheila Birgen. I'm the country lead for Innovate UK KTN, and I'll be moderating this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Birgen. Uh, there are some spaces ahead here, so I'll request that we, maybe those who are there, just move so that those who are coming later don't have to have a problem. Kindly just move so that we can occupy all these seats, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you for responding. Let's just move to make sure that they only leave two seats for any emergency, but the rest cover them. Asante Sana. Um, I don't have much to say, but I just want to have a very brief introduction to our guests. Uh, I just want to say that we honor you and we thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. Uh, we are a young university, 
and uh, we really value our partners because we know it is through partnership that we can be able to grow our university. We have a very strong mandate because in the North Rift we want to claim our space and we would like to make sure that we reach out to the entire North Rift and uh, the nation at large. But our primary, uh, uh, our primary counties is Noreb uh, with some extension to Elreb uh, so that we are able to uh, make sure that whatever we are doing uh, we serve our area uh, adequately. Our motto at the University of Eldoret is flame of knowledge and innovation. Now this is what makes innovation a very important factor in our everything that we do. And uh, given that we are young, we have not put enough in innovation. And from last year, we deliberately decided to now make sure that we emphasize so much on innovations so that we are true to our motto. And uh, that we have done at different levels. And uh, our chief guests, I just want to inform you that uh, we are in the process and uh, it has been passed through our Senate that we are going to have, uh, to streamline innovations, we are going to have a cross-cutting course at first year and at the first year and second year, which deals with innovations. So that our students, when they come here, everybody does some course that streamline innovation in the university. And that one has been passed by Senate. Another attempt that we have done is to have a BSc course on innovations. And this has been domiciled in the School of Business, where we are sitting. And so we are expect that the School of Business is going to spear ahead so that we have a fully fledged course uh, like the one is already being offered in JQuat. And it's a very good course that gives that broad base so that we have people who are going to help us to carry up that. And lastly, a master's degree also in that line of innovation. With the, even if they have more buyers of entrepreneurship plus innovation, but of course, uh, something that is going to streamline uh, innovation in the University of Eldoret. Now, apart from that, then we have this function that we have today, the Innovation Week. Uh, this is our fourth Innovation Week, uh, where we would like to share, or rather to showcase, the innovations that we have. We have. And the university have a lot of these innovations, some of them which have been lying in different places. Uh, there's a lot of innovations that come up during the research of our uh, fourth year students. At fourth year, we have a special project. And those special projects come up with these very novel ideas which we have not been exploiting. And the current directorate of research and the innovation have been targeted to make sure that all those are reported and they are assisted. We have a lot of our master's degree students or other thesis research where there's a lot of innovations also that comes up. Uh, we have our PhD students also. And even this interaction between the students and their uh, supervisors, uh, there is a lot that we need to harness. Now, we introduced Innovation Week so that we could dedicate our time, just stop and think about a theme. Last year, we had a different theme, and this year, we have the theme on building livelihoods through innovation. And we thought the theme is very current and very appropriate at this point in time, because you know what is going on even in our country today. People are going hungry, and we need at least innovations that can help us to help such kind of people. And as a university, we need to give solutions. There is no way that some people can be hungry just behind us here, and we have not come up with an innovation that can be able to assist them. And we want to thank some people who have already come up with something. Uh, and when I talk of this, I remember the group of Mugalavai and uh, is it Professor Nkware, the Ugali Pap and the Uji Pap, you know? 
in this kind of hunger, if at all that kind of food can be taken to those areas, the kids who are already dying, already the nutritious level, nutrition level is very high, and we don't need firewood and we need only a lot of things. Just hot water that we can get through solar. And then you pour that hot water and you pour that and already the ugali is ready and the uji is ready. Uh, these are some of the things that we really need to think about. So that we as a university and our stakeholders, because we don't want to operate alone. As I said, we are in the North Rift. Whatever we are doing, we want to know are Eldoret National Polytechnic, what are they doing? What are the RVTTI doing? What are the other institutions in the region doing so that we can work together? And that's why we normally attend any fair. If they have a fair, we also invite them. And I hope here we must have, must be having. Do you have people from uh, our National Polytechnic, Eldoret? Hmm? RVTTI, have they arrived? Just raise up your hand. Yeah, excellent. That's very good. Yeah, I would like to be working together because that is what makes us uh, to be strong in what we are doing in the region. So this is a, this function is very important. Uh, we know the university is now job market is a challenge uh, in the nation of the nation. But then we can be able to create those jobs so that we don't think of going to school to be employed. And our chief guest, this is a problem in our institutions. You find somebody who has done agricultural economics sitting down at home with a whole master's in agricultural economics. You have a, a, a very vibrant first class student with business management. In fact, there's a time one came to me, and, I mean another mother, that my, my daughter is at home and he did business management and there's nothing that she's doing. She's just at home. I say, how can she be that foolish? I mean, she has been taught. Give me that girl so that I can talk to that girl. So I talked with that girl. And within one year, that girl came up with, she was doing some flowers with you, just collecting bottles that have been thrown away. And then she's doing some decorations on them and some flowers. The lady is now an employer within two years. So there is a lot that we need to, the orientation that we need to change. But that orientation will come more live when we interact with specialists like the people who are in front of us here. And so we want, I know it's not my, our function, it is your function because me, they can get me anywhere, but you, <laughs> if you have to get you, it takes time. So I would like to give ample time uh, so that we may continue with the program. So with those uh, few remarks, I think, I don't know if there are few or many, but you later know where they are stand, they are always few, isn't it? Even if they are two hours, remarks it. <laughs> so with those few remarks, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to declare this uh, function officially open, uh, particularly this discussion. The whole uh, innovation week will be officially open tomorrow, but this interaction, we want to declare it officially open so that we may be able to interact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, DVC. Um, I said that we are going to have dialogue. And uh, it will not be one-sided. We want you to, par to participate actively as possible. We are going to have moderators. And the moderators we have, we have two moderators, one from outside and one from inside. The one from inside is sitting on my far right. Professor Kitainge is going to be the second moderator. The first moderator is Madame Sheila, who is here. You notice I'll put them at the ends while we have the, <laughs> the discussants right in the middle of them. These moderators will be asking questions and the discussants are going to react. Uh, and it will not end there because from those reactions, we hope they will have primed you enough to ask some good questions. Now let me remind you again 
that the topic of our discussion is fostering collaborations between universities and the private sector, but we also have public sector here. You may know that we have memoranda of understanding with most of the counties around us here and several other institutions. So that also means that we have some level of collaboration. But we'd want to hear what would be the most appropriate and what is the way forward that we should be moving into so that we have effective and efficient collaboration. Collaboration that has outcomes that are tangible, outcomes that are experienced by the community around and the industries that we have around. Let me tell you one thing. The universities outside there, where people like Professor Aburu went to school, they are the ones who solve the problems of industry and the problems of government. That means the collaboration they have with these institutions is such that when these institutions have a problem, they come to the university. They discuss and agree and the university help them solve the problem. I don't know whether we are doing that here. These are some of the things that I think we need to question and find a way forward. One time I had a student who developed a, a very good product, uh, a metabolite from a rhizobacterium. We isolated it, we tested it, and we tried to see its efficacy. And we realized that this compound was very potent on controlling leaf fungal diseases of plants. So I walked around. I was feeling, when we have this, can we then bring in industry so that we can develop a product? The doors that I knocked, I realized that most of the industries we have in this country are subsidiaries of those guys up there. And those guys do their own research. They develop their own products. So when you say you have something from here, they look at you and they don't believe you. We have some industries here, some local like Kenya Seed. I don't know what we can do with them because we have products that we need to push forward so that we can have um, final products that can be useful locally. But are we moving in that direction? Or can we move into that direction? I was making those comments to prime all of us. And now I want to uh, pass the button to our first moderator, Sheila, to ask uh, one question, which can be answered. I think we can ask maybe one per person yes. for now, yes. and then uh, we can have follow-on questions. And yes. if we'll have time, then we'll definitely exactly. take a few more from the audience. OK. Yes. So go for it. Thank you. So um, that is a really good context setting that you've done, Prof. Thank you. Um, the, the reason we are having this discussion today on uh, making collaboration work is uh, beyond just the you know, collaboration on, on research that can happen between industry post uh, the research being done. Is it possible for us to have uh, industry-led research or industry-informed research or industry-driven research? How can we collaborate with industry, with government, with fellow researchers um, across the country and beyond to be able to facilitate for some of these things to happen. Um, just before I ask the questions, um, i just briefly tell you about uh, Innovate UK, KTN. Uh, Innovate UK uh, is under the UK government, under the research and innovation pillar. And of course, such things are key to what we do. We focus on knowledge transfer, and most of the work that we do within knowledge transfer is either 
within academia. So we have something called uh, knowledge uh, partnerships between universities where researchers are placed uh, within um, especially large organizations to be able to do research within the organizations and it makes it easy for, commercialize, for commercialization of that research to happen. In Kenya we do this uh, through something we call open innovation where we find large organizations so we're working with Unilever, with Flamingo, with uh, guys like KQ. Um, finding the challenges that they have within their organizations and then placing them with people who have solutions to those specific niche uh, challenges. Um, we also do uh, strengthening investment pipelines. So we have grant opportunities in, in different industries, but also looking upstream, working with the investors to be able to unlock more investment into innovations happening in the country. And here specifically in Eldoret, we are looking at something called place-based innovation. So um, like what Prof was saying, if there's a specific challenge that is being felt here, how can we mobilize the network of innovators, of private sector, of government, of uh, researchers to be able to work on that specific challenge locally? But like we know, most challenges are not just local. They might be felt here, but they are also felt in so many other regions. Once you've solved it here, how can we scale it maybe regionally, nationally, or even globally? Because essentially, the main purpose of innovation is to be able to, to solve those particular challenges. And so place-based innovation is looking at localized um, innovation for local challenges but with a broader or a global perspective. So I think we'll get straight into the, um, into the question. And I think I will start with uh, uh, just from where Prof ended on um, research that is informed by you know, industry, uh, but especially locally. And so I'll, I'll send this to Esther. Um, what is it that Kenya Seed, for instance, has been doing with, uh, with research institutions, and even research that you do within the, um, the organization, how is that, what informs the, those types of, of research? Thank you. Um, our research basically is uh, market driven. Uh, it's actually the department of marketing that feeds the research with um, what really needs to be developed in terms of R&D. And uh, as Kenya said, we have uh, fully-fledged research, although it's not an institution per se, but we are working towards making it as a research institution, whereby we'll be able to position ourselves to receive funding from either the government or the yeah, non-government uh, bodies so that we can be able to, 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 to take the research to another level. Uh, nonetheless, our research programs are done uh, locally and uh, even outside Kenya, basing on uh, you know, what the market requires. And uh, University of Eldoret being one of them, we are handling materials with them like the Eldo Mavuno and the Eldo Baraka that is on the wheat and uh, we are also doing NPTs with them here, National Performance Trials of, um, of our materials, together with uh, KFIS, just to make sure that uh, the products that we, we, we are taking to the market, they've already met the, the requirements, and they're superior in nature, and they can be able to guarantee food security. So apart from University of Eldoret, uh, we also have other universities like uh, Kenyatta University. We are also doing something with them on beans, that is climbing beans. Uh, we imported that technology here last year. No, not last, the last time we were having the agribusiness here. And uh, it, it is uh, an, an, an innovation that we saw it, you know, bringing a lot of results. And uh, you looking at it, I mean, um, uh, on a broader perspective, it's, it's something that will address the issue of uh, land pressure. It's an issue that will address the issue of productivity, co 
because uh, you look at having high production within or maximizing production within a small unit of area. And uh, we're also doing uh, collaborations in terms of research, getting superior materials and blending with our local from CIMIT. It's actually a renowned research institution, which we are all aware. And uh, yeah, we, we, a blend of those uh, germplasm research materials will guarantee and has also been the reason why Kenya Seed has been on top in terms of uh, quality and superior materials. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Esther. I think I'll bring, I don't know, someone from the university. I think just for us to understand, um, in such collaboration, uh, uh, you will decide who <laughs> from the university will answer this. In terms of uh, collaboration with the uh, with private sector um, and co-ownership of such uh, ideas that come to life, how does that work? And then, I mean, of course, because of IP related issues, and this is something that comes up. I'm not saying you're going to details of it, but co-ownership, assuming it's coming from universities, or if a researcher, for instance, from the university wants to work with someone in the private sector like Kenya Seed, how does the engagement look like? Um, and if, for instance, I'm coming from industry and I want to collaborate with the university on research on specific things, assuming in this case, um, the solution you had, um, and you come to an, to an organization and say, okay, there's this something we've developed, we would like to work with you to now develop a product. How does the co-ownership uh, of that look like? Uh, thank you so much. I think, uh, to be brief, uh, we have all the relevant policies. First of all, we have a research and innovation policy which governs the, governs the whole of research also talks about that. And then we have the intellectual property policy, which is now more specific on that. And the, any work that we are doing, normally we do them through um, MOUs. And uh, we have a fully fledged directorate that deals with that, uh, director of industrial linkages, partnerships and collaborations. And the gentleman at the far end is the brand new director, uh, the former one has joined uh, Yulita. She's now the deputy governor of Marakwet. So we have exported some of that there, <laughs> the way we exported the Yulita. But generally, we have the policies. So when we operate the under uh, MOUs, within the MOUs also is specified about each and every product that's going to come out, how it's going to be handled. So that one is there. Thank you. So thank you for, for that. I think I'll go to Dr. Yulita on this. Um, I think just because of policy, but also in terms of uh, how much does research or data inform government's decision, uh, both at you know, uh, uh, devolved uh, functions of the government and national government, and how important is, is research or commercialization of the same uh, for government. Thank you so much, uh, Sheila. <coughs> Allow me to say that for a very long time, uh, governments have generated data, but whether that data is used to inform decision is a different story. Uh, but uh, from where I sit, currently the conversation that is ongoing is to see how that data, whether from research or just looking at uh, secondary data, uh, is going to be useful in deciding priorities for investment and for focus. Um, where in Nandi County, in the year 2020, we elected to participate in Open Governance Partnership open government partnership and out of that we have been able to push ourselves to do more than the general we are now we are more open you can scrutinize our documents you can access them online and one of the things that we are we are realizing you know on, on just by the click of a button you can know the distribution of projects which part of the county has been overfunded 
as opposed to another. In, and, but one of the things that, because this is a still an ongoing process, one of the things we, we hope that once we are done with updating our data, we'll be able to, to capture the skill sets that we have within the county. And that way, we will be able to know areas that we need to emphasize and encourage our citizens to train on. When we know that we have a gap here, and in areas that we know we, we have probably um, overtrained, or we have a huge number of uh, human resource in that particular, we, we identify areas that we can export that skill. So really, um, I would like to say that in day-to-day -day activities of government, a lot of data is generated. But uh, sometimes, because of the high turnover of, of uh, human resource, probably there is a change of regime five years after five years, you find that some of the officers who have generated that data may have exited. So the person who comes in next may not prioritize what has been generated already and may want to start afresh. So sometimes there is, there is lack of synergy, there is lack of flow, uh, but if we were to have an honest conversation, we have a lot of data in this country. One of the things that uh, you've asked about policies, Kenya is one country that has policies, has laws, has regulations, has guidelines, but the challenge usually is implementation. Mm -hmm. And a number of countries in the region have come, they've bent much, been bent much in, benchmarked in Kenya and implemented, and they are way ahead of us because we, we just generated and left it on the shelves. Thank you. Yeah, and essentially that's almost like what happens with a lot of uh, our research in this country. It's done within institutions, and then it's really brilliant research, but then it's just left in the shelves. So how then can we, as private sector, ensure that that doesn't happen? And I'll, I'll send this to, uh, to Julius from ABSA. What can private sector do to ensure that we, we engage academic institution, we engage government to ensure that these brilliant you know, ideas and research that have been done within the institution is actually absorbed in the, in the industry. What can we do on our side as private sector now? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, as as uh, APSA Bank, uh, our purpose is to be bringing possibilities to life. And uh, any time I come in a forum where we have young innovators, brilliant minds, good ideas, uh, as APSA, we are bringing the possibility of actualizing that good uh, ideas that you have by giving you the resources to be able to actualize that great idea. So in APSA, we we embrace a lot of these innovations, and you will notice that we are one of the few banks, if not the only bank, that's now doing banking through WhatsApp. That you can chat on WhatsApp and you're interacting with your account. So f for those who might not be knowing, I want you to save this number. 0710 and you can save it as ABI, A double B Y. So, uh, and if you are real on WhatsApp, you can just type anything and ABI will be able to assist you to uh, engage, be able to know more about APSA, the kind of products that APSA has. Account opening, you can open real time. It can help you to access your account real time. That's where we are heading. And uh, those are, that's one of the avenues through which we've been able to embrace innovation. The other thing that we are doing as APSA to embrace some of the good ideas that you are coming up with is that we have embraced robotics in a big way. You find our back office now is running courtesy of robots and with minimal human intervention. Someone applies for a loan and within a few hours it is disbursed because in the back end, we have automated quite a good number of those processes, courtesy of your good innovations that have come uh, to us. 
currently, if you want to open an account, you go to Google Store, you download the app, the apps are up. It will guide you end-to-end -end process through which you can open an account. So we have digitized those processes and we are benefiting significantly from the innovations that are coming from our young innovators. We have a program in the bank called Ready to Work. And we work closely with uh, university students and uh, tertiary institutions as well, even high schools. And in that program, we take our, our, our uh, the, the cohorts through four set of skills. One is entrepreneurship. The second one is work skills. The third one is people skills. And lastly, money skills. So it's through that program. And it's a program that runs for up to 18 months. And we are encouraging us to enroll into that program. You just get to you know, your app, Google's App Store and uh, uh, just type ready to work. You'll be able to get a link there and register. All it asks you for is your email address and some few personal uh, specific information and you will become, uh, you will have enrolled into the program. So the program runs for 18 months, we'll attach you to mentors, we'll walk the journey with you and be able to help you develop and grow your idea as a young person. We also, as, as an institution, listen to, and it's some of the, inform of the things that we do as a, as, a, as a bank is driven by the industry requirements or demands. We engage with the county governments and they give us a challenge of developing a revenue collection system where we can be able to integrate with them. We work with an innovators who are already in that space. They custom make uh, a system, um, uh, a software that can be able to do that. So, and, and we are able to support the counties to collect that revenue in real time. So it's some of the, we, we are actually working with innovators and we am really, excited that I'm in your space so that we can see how we can support you. Then lastly, uh, we believe in data and that's where banking is going. Banking is driven by data. We now have a department of uh, data-led cells where everything is driven by data and we have uh, picked best, best practice from even from uh, your Android phone I'm sure from time to time you get some adverts that keep popping up. It uses emotional intelligence and it, it studies your behavior on some of your interests that you do have as you, you Google or you check some of the sites on your, on your phone. So that we are using that intelligence to be able to drive the needs of the society and even how we are uh, developing our products to speak to the market. So we benefit significantly from data-led cells. It is driving our cells. You will notice that our back office is becoming leaner as the front office is becoming bigger. It's because some of the repetitive activities in the back office, you come to the bank today and you want to deposit your cash, you, go, you get to the ATM and there's a machine we call uh, cash deposit machines. It's a self-service machine. It can receive up to one million uh, deposits. So you really don't need to see a teller to be able to do that. And those are some of the things that we are doing as a bank. And uh, just to answer Sheila directly, as a bank, we are well aligned. We have very good solutions for the entrepreneurs and we happy to walk through uh, that journey with you. We run some training programs through webinars and uh, uh, those programs you, you enroll. Once you've enrolled on to Ready to Work and also the SME propositions that we have, we will be training you every two weeks. Uh, the, 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 the trainings are running uh, bi-weekly and we try as much as possible to attach you to mentors and we walk the journey with you. And in the process, we are able to fund your ideas. We are one of the few banks that can be able to fund startups uh, because once we walk in that journey with you, we are able to tell whether you are good enough to manage the resources. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, those are very interesting and, and I think good insights for people who uh, want to work with private sector. But sometimes it's very difficult for the innovators 
especially when they are starting on in universities, to actually be able to reach the you know organizations like ABSA, like big organizations uh, like that. So you find there are intermediaries in the middle who either will build capacity of the of the researchers or in the or the, or the innovators, um, but they also work with different players. They work with government, they work with private sector, they work with academia. So for intermediaries like Eldo Hub, what do you think is the role that you know intermediaries like yourself play? And what are some of the uh, you know opportunities for innovators that are there in the market to be able to easily transform the work that they are doing to be able to work with industry. Thank you so much, uh, Sheila. And um, I think um, a lot has been said for today, especially research-led and data-driven uh, solutions. And I'm really happy that uh, we don't lack uh, policies and laws, as, um, as uh, Excellency, the Deputy Governor said. And uh, there is there's need for implementation. And I think that's something that as the <coughs> intermediaries or rather the innovation hubs we've been pushing for to ensure that you know we have laws that actually create an enabling environment for the innovators and for the entrepreneurs to bring those ideas to life. And uh, if you've all heard about the starter bill uh, which was proposed by the uh, current uh, governor of Nairobi, Johnson Sakaja, and uh, one of the things uh, in the starter bill was uh, how can we support innovators? How can we support the innovation ecosystem to be able uh, to support those ideas, to bring them to life? Of course, uh, those are some of the things as intermediaries we are pushing for. We are pushing for the implementation of these laws. But again, you know, we provide also that peer-to-peer -peer platform where the innovators, the private sector, the government, you know, come together to think about and brainstorm about different ways in which we can support research and we also can enable, can um, work on data. And uh, one of the things that we lack and in terms of uh, challenges are we don't really have data. I know that, especially local data. And uh, most of the data that has been collected, they are collected by international organization. And sometimes they really understand our local market. But to us, we don't understand our local market. That is why you will find our local innovators being disrupted by international, uh, or in an international startups. You've seen the Uber and the rest. And how can we train the, the startups and the innovators to think globally so that you know when uh, you know, when they have access to this data, and I think uh, this is where we rely on the university to provide us, the university, the government, to provide us as the intermediaries with data that will enable the innovators to make informed decision as they come up with different solutions to the challenges that we have uh, currently. And um, an example is as simple as, like for example, currently even in Eldorate, for example, there is an issue with waste management. I don't know if you've heard about that. And um, we don't have data. We don't even know how much data is generated on a daily basis in Wasingishu County. So innovators, how if we have that, um, uh, that if we have that information or that data, it will really inform how we come up with uh, different solutions to those challenges. So for us, uh, as the intermediaries, I think uh, we uh, we want the government, of course, to support us in terms of uh, uh, making sure that the laws that are available are well implemented, so that it creates an enabling environment for entrepreneurs to thrive. You've also, you know, there is the issue of double registration. There's a lot of processes that are in involved. Even if you are in food security, for example, you have to go to CAPS and sometimes uh, innovators are sent from one office to the other because even the government don't understand how do we regulate such a startup. 
how do we regulate such an innovation? Because I, I think they've never been prepared for that. So we rely on the government, and we can actually support the government on this in terms of uh, offering them some of the solution and even giving them some of these innovations that are in existence. And for the, um, for the university, or rather the academia, you know, the research institution, how can we get those uh, researchers, for example, you know, once you've already supported them in the university, they can actually go to the innovation hub like Eldo Hub, and we can actually mentor them, we can train them, we can provide linkages through some of the partners that we have, so that you know they can uh, move that idea to the next stage. And I'm happy to mention that you know we have two startups that have come from uh, uh, University of Eldoret that we've worked with. And uh, of course, um, uh, we took them. They just had the paper, but we were able to help them to implement that idea to even a point where they've been able to raise funding. And uh, they've been able to uh, participate in both local and international um, uh, programs that enables them to take their ideas to life. So those are some of the things that we can help. Uh, the one, in terms of uh, support the government in terms of implementation of those policies and improving them. Uh, secondly, of course, we can help the research uh, to be commercialized and take to the next uh, level, among other things that we can co-create together to see innovation and to create, to foster innovation in the North Thrift region. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Magdalene. So prepare your questions. I'm going around for another round of questions to the panelists, then I'll come to the audience. So we've discussed the knowledge part of, you know, research. But there's an equally important part of research that sometimes we don't discuss, which is skill. And the importance of TVETs um, in, in research, especially on technical um, research, and working with the industry to ensure that we have the right skills, uh, we have the right equipment, we have the right tools that people in the industry use. How much research is done on that? How do we support? skill and talent as intermediaries. I think I'll start with you on this one. How do we support skill and, and talent and work with, for instance, with TVETs across the country to ensure that the, um, the, 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 the talent and you know, the, uh, the students who are coming out of TVETs mm -hmm. are absorbed into the industry, but also that the industry looks to TVETs to ensure that they build their capacity in terms of uh, technical and uh, equipment that they would require. Yeah. Uh, thank you again. I think um, uh, TVET are doing amazing job in terms of uh, preparing the technical uh, skills and knowledge of the of the young people, and um, and 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 the academia as well. So there is no problem in terms of, uh, of course there is a problem and other things, but then there, is, um, there are so many young people who've gone through the academic institutions. There are so many people who have gone through uh, the TVET institution. But now the challenge is once they are done with their academic training, this is where there is a disconnect. Because I think there is no collaboration and synergies among the, I, uh, the industry and the academic institution. And sometimes they, uh, the, the youth are not really, um, the student, can I call them, the student are not really prepared to understand how the market is. So there is a mismatch between what is required by the market and um, and also what they've been taught in their in their in their schools. So that's uh, that's the challenge that we realize. And what we are doing as an as Elder Hub, for example, we have a program which is called the Digital Apprenticeship Program, which we are now uh, scaling it up using a platform called Sasakazi. So what we do, we work with the uh, industry. We work with the businesses, which are tech startups, traditional uh, non-tech businesses, and also uh, international and scale-up organizations. So what we do, we identify the digital projects that these organizations have. Like, for example, if you have, uh, you want to develop an e-commerce platform, you want to develop a chat port, for example. So we identify what are their digital needs. From their digital needs now, we recruit young people from the TVET institution, uh, from the universities and among others. And you don't need to really have gone through university to be part of this program. And uh, the most important thing that we look at is expertise. 
expertise what can you be what can you deliver you know can you deliver on an assignment that we can assign you so based on the needs of the businesses or and then we i we actually link you up with the with the with the with the digital projects and uh, based of course on your expertise and one of the things that we've seen uh, especially during covid 19 is um, the skills that are really needed at the moment are digital marketing skills i think it's because people are starting to realize that the need of being online and then also there is uh, followed by software development there is data there is um, so we've classified them into hard skills and the soft skills so for us hard skills are software development iot machine learning artificial intelligence and all that and then the softer skills is the digital marketing graphic design and all that so most of the skills that are needed are the uh, of course the, the the softer skills by so many but then also there is a need for software developers and we've seen uh, a lot of companies setting up in kenya international companies setting up in kenya meaning that you know there is an increased competition of digital talent and uh, you know now they are fighting among the banking institution the internet service providers and all this so they are fighting for the few digital talents that we have so there is a need for collaboration between the tvet institutions the universities so that you know we they can understand the needs uh, of the market it's uh, numerous challenges that i know we are all uh, private we as farmers and uh, we do wish that uh, yeah, as an organization and even as students, as they're being packaged for the industry, they are also equipped with uh, this technical know-how, with this knowledge, so that they assist us when they get out to the industry. Uh, the issue of climate change is real, and uh, ways or uh, how to devise resilience in our farmers, resilient varieties or materials, that can be able to adapt to these climatic uh, conditions that you're having. We are trying as an, as an organization to develop these uh, materials, although it takes some time because ours, uh, our mode of production or uh, multiplying and uh, you know, getting the seed is a conventional way of, uh, of uh, natural breeding and selection. So that takes some time and uh, if we can look into that so that uh, we, we promote other enterprises, we promote other value chains that can be able to still assist us, glob I mean all of us, like uh, corporately, to uh, achieve our goal of uh, meeting our food requirements by promoting uh, resilience in our materials, resilience among the value chains that we have in the country. And uh, I see also um, the, the way pressure uh, is being put by uh, us, you know, growing in terms of population. And the land is not increasing. But we as, of course, human beings, we are getting here families, we are growing our families. And these are the same people, the same mouths that we need to feed. So how best can we feed these people uh, with the limited space or limited resources that we have? Uh, we are looking at an innovation. We call it urban farming. Most of us, we know we, we really desire to do farming. We really desire to grow our own food in our balconies. We really desire to grow food in our corridors or, you know, at the verandas, we are not privileged, all of us privileged to have lands. So as an organization, we are trying to innovatively looking for anything available, even this uh, plastic bottle, using it to grow food. We are using even used tires. And uh, if you've had an opportunity or an experience in most of our uh, programs out in the field, those are the technologies and innovations that we are trying to promote so that um, instead of those kids in the, in the estates playing with those tires, you can quickly convert that to be your farm by growing enough food for your family. You know, when we are, we are, we are food secure at a, the household level, we are better, you know, 
than all of us looking at one source of getting uh, our our food. So we, we, we're looking at individuals, how to get food, food secure as an individual, and using the cheapest and available resource that uh, we have at our disposal to be able to grow food. And um, another opportunity which I think we can all of us explore as, an as uh, partners is that uh, these students, uh, we, we, we wish and we pray that even as we look at the challenge of productivity, which is coming down, we have cut a niche and uh, identified our soil. And I know as, as, as an institution, as a university, you have a strong department or a unit, I don't know how you call it, on soil care. Uh, we pray and we wish that we can leverage that and enhance the scope, expound, and make it as a basic in, I mean, uh, training for all students, so that when they get out there, because we realized one of the, uh, the, the key components that is affecting productivity out there is the issue of soil. So we can quickly address it from that point of view. And when we get out there, you know, uh, we, we look at several variables that contribute to productivity. We have certified seeds, we have moisture, which is rain, or maybe we can substitute with the irrigation. We also have, uh, the issue of tec uh, t the technical part and soil is also very critical. So soil care is an important and a very critical resource that we are privileged as an institution here at university, you are privileged. So we pray that you make it uh, and you broaden it, the scope, so that once the students are packaged out there, um, packaged mm -hmm. for the institution, they will come and provide solution to most of these challenges that we're experiencing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead for the second question. Thank you. The next question will go to the banking sector and our other collaborators. At the university, we have, uh, and TTI is a university and in technical institutions, we have youthful population that is engaged at most to about 40% of their time in school they have time. How can we utilize that time innovatively, possibly to deal with as an opportunity in your organizations or challenges existing in your organizations? We turn their time into a, an opportunity for them to innovate for you and also for their livelihoods. How can we engage our youthful students productively to solve a problem existing in your organization. That applies to all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. I'm good. Yeah, I, th I think that's a very good question, and uh, it basically ties to the, the youth who are actually uh, our audience this afternoon. And I think as a bank, what we are basically doing is that, uh, you know, every day we are trying to, to come up with products that we feel, you know, that would be able to ta tap into the larger uh, population. You realize that for all of us as youth, and more, more importantly, some of the students who are here, to be able to log in there, and when they get into that particular cohort and they go through that uh, training, then we are able to harness and tap some of the ideas that they are having. And if you look at some of the, the products that we are now coming up with, like the WhatsApp banking and all this kind of thing, these are some of the things that have come up through as a result of some of these initiatives that we are getting from the young people. So when we take you through that program, then we are able to, to mentor you in there we are able to take you through entrepreneurial skills because at the end of the day, as youth or as a student, your purpose is to be able to either, when you leave this place, you either get ready to work and be fit into that organization very well in there and be more productive or become an entrepreneur. So when you become an entrepreneur, that's another avenue where you can be able to make money for yourself and to be able to grow as a person. So we, we, we tap into some of those ideas so we are able to pull you in there uh, 
And when you come in there, remember banks really rely on the market insights. So we do a lot of, we rely on the research that is being done by, 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 by innovators or young people. So because they are the people who tell us this is the direction. So, and that's where all banks really go. So they will say, this is where more preferences are coming in. And that's why you hear us talking about data science, data-led uh, business, because we rely on the information that we are coming in. And this information will basically come from the research that is being done by the students. So you come in there, you bring in these innovative ideas, we are able to tap into that. And we have a whole, like for APSA, we have a whole department that basically takes care of research. So some of those ideas can actually be pulled in there. And, and you, you grow in there and you become a very useful, you know, that idea that you have grows and, you know, a product is designed. And that's how banks make money anyway. Because they tap into a niche that is very new and they, they, they become the first in that market and they are able to, to excel in that area. So that's where we encourage quite a number of, uh, you know, young people to go in there bring in some of those ideas, and then we grow it, and it becomes a business idea. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So maybe I can ask the same question to Eldohab. What can they do with their time? OK. Um, I would like to mention first about uh, what we want the, what we would have maybe as the industry, what the industry really need from the university as you prepare the uh, the your students or rather the trainees. I think one of the most important thing um, I've talked about before is the soft skills. Uh, soft skills are very key because uh, I don't think the university has any problem in terms of uh, technical training. Like if it's a computer science person, you've already trained them on all the coding skills among other things. But then uh, there's uh, soft skills, you know, those skills that are not tech but are needed to grow one's career and uh, including the attitude, even CV writing. We've seen so many young people struggle with even writing their own CV. So if they can be programs that will enable them to, to write those CVs, I think it will really go a long way. Another thing which is very key, especially now, you know, initially um, innovation was not really key in some of this industry. But now digital transformation and innovation is something that every company has actually come to appreciate. Some of them have even added it to their agenda. So if you are preparing these uh, young people, then also you need to enable them to be innovative and you need to teach them how to be innovative and as well as also being creative. And uh, problem solving is one of the things that are very key. You know, they are going to figure out things on their own and uh, probably equipping them with those problem solving will be very good. And also things such as attitude, I think some, something that we really struggle with the um, entry level uh, young people. I think they come in with the attitude that, you know, um, they, you know, they are in the, you know, they've got an employment or maybe they need, you know, they deserve to be uh, given some more uh, favors, they deserve to be given even more salary, raise, the salary, a bigger salary. Uh, and uh, sometimes also it's really take time. They need to understand the policies of the organization. They also need to understand that they are not as experienced and they need to use such opportunities to actually, first of all, work on building their experience. And another thing is uh, entrepreneurship. Even if they are not going to start their own businesses, I think it's a very uh, must-have skill. And uh, if you get employed, I think entrepreneurship is an is entrepreneurship within an organization. You are not the person who started that organization, but actually you can support their vision by be having an entrepreneurship mindset. Uh, when the APSA has talked about some of this program, you could see that you know there is a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot of thinking that needs uh, to go out there. And of course, all this can, if we can have programs such as design thinking. So my point is, don't really focus, uh, as much as you focus on the, the main courses, I think extra uh, programs will actually enable them to do that. And I think one of the things, and something that can be a quick win for us, even as Elder Hub and the universities, we can organize a career fair I don't know if our DVC is here, we can organize a career fair, which can actually bring in the ICT industry and the students, so that you know these young people can actually do mock interviews 
and uh, we've done this before. They can do mock interviews with Safaricom. We can bring in all these uh, organizations that we've worked with, and they can do speed interviews, more like speed networking, but it is now interviews. So they get to be asked, you know, what tell us about yourself, etc., etc., and the student can actually prepare to actually do those mock interviews. And there is more, more, and like I said, you know, we cannot exhaust some of the ideas that we have, but actually we can sit down and co-create together to see what um, what we can do and what we can support bringing in the industry mindset. And I want to give an example of, uh, I did, uh, I think when the DVC was giving us an overview of, um, of the Innovation Week and the University of Eldoret and the master's program, including the innovation program. I, after my university, I actually went to Strathmore University at Safaricom Academy. And uh, Safaricom Academy was partnering with Strathmore University to run an, an in a more an, an, a, a master's degree which was industry driven and it was based on the challenges that Safaricom was having. So the program was so focused not only on academic, it was focused on the technical skills, the soft skills, and then also we had projects and uh, in my thesis, I had an industry supervisor and an academic supervisor. So my industry supervisor was from um, Google. She's called Dr. Shiko, and she was studying at Cape Town. So that really opened up so many things and opened up so many networks in my career. And uh, that, I think, has really been very useful. I don't know if maybe that model can be adopted at the University of Eldoret, so that you know there is that. Uh, ICT industry uh, partnering even throughout the study uh, of, of, the, of the students and more and more we can co-create more other ways. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I have one question for uh, Your Excellency and then I think if you have any question you can also ask her and then we will come back to you Prof uh, for the, for the uh, questions from the participants. What can private sector do to work with government, especially to improve um, such collaborations in education? Um, what can we do? Or how can we you know, work with government? Um, thank you so much, Sheila. I, I am getting a lot from this sharing. And I can confidently say that, you know, in the space that we work in government, we're always running short of resources. We have, we, we wish to develop skills in our citizens, but when we look at the funding basket, mm. it is usually so strained. The demand for that particular basket is usually so huge, so that when you spread it, it becomes too thin. So from where I sit, if we could get partners with uh, private sector who can support us with skills development in areas that we know uh, we have gaps, mm -hmm. that would be very useful for us. Um, secondly, with universities, um, as they, I want to concur with uh, Magdalene, that in, in, in our, uh, mentoring our young people and churning out skills to come out to the workforce, a lot needs to be done on attitude and the soft skills, being able to express yourself. Sometimes you get somebody who has gone through a program, a four-year, five-year program, but they struggle communicating. So I think that aspect of communication as a skill is one of those uh, investments that we can make as universities. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you still to the to Her Excellency. And this is uh, to tap on your experience, especially the lessons you've learned out there in the school of the world. You are one of us, mm -hmm. and there must be something that you have for university lecturers, what opportunities are existing that we miss, possibly due to our orientation? What opportunities are existing 
and how can we tap on our expertise that exists in the universities with regard to possibly in the areas of sciences, in the areas of business, in the areas of education, where we are very strong, but we are not coming out. How can we come out? Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to share my own experience, that when I stepped out of the classroom into this space of politics, you realize that you have been living in a shielded environment. And many times when you're here, the students come to you. But when you go out to that other space, you find that you have to go out to the community to connect. And one of the, the conclusions that I have come to is that there is a lot of gap uh, out there on the presence of professionals in the community. Most of us over concentrate on the jobs that we have been given, mm -hmm. but the impact that we have in the community is zero. The challenges that the, our communities are going through lack the support and the input of our professionals. And as lecturers, there are things that if you did at a personal level or even collectively, you would do so much good for our community. I remember way back in 2000, the year 2000, 2001, the early years of 2000, the initiative that came from this university under Moy, where people went out through uh, on, on outreaches to, en to mentor, to challenge, to encourage your learners in primary and secondary school to aspire to come to the university. We saw a big impact, especially from the region where I come from, where the numbers of the citizens that got their way to the university increased. Mm -hmm. And it is because there was a deliberate effort from those in the university to go out to the community. As we speak right now, there are a number of challenges that our young people are going through. Our education system has put on a lot of pressure on our children. Our children no longer have time with their parents. We are churning out people who don't have very strong foundations. And even ourselves, even as parents, we hardly had time for those, those children. So really, those are situations that we find ourselves in as a nation that if we are not intentional about, what we are witnessing is only a tip of the iceberg. Mm. We are not producing strong people. We have young people who we are, we, are tr we, are, we are allowing them to go through the education system. A number, if you look and you, you, you look at the reports that we receive almost on a weekly basis, you find young people harming one another, killing each other, just love triangles. Our, our foundations have been shaken. Allow me to end there. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Wow, ladies and gentlemen. Our foundations have been shaken. And who will strengthen these foundations? It's you. Um, I have come here so that we can guide ourselves on asking a few questions to these very prominent guys that we have here. But before I allow you to ask questions, let me say a few things. At the University of Eldoret, we have established an outreach center. This center purposefully was established so that the university can reach the community, the farmers, and industry. Why? Because we've been told many times that the university is an ivory tower. Also, that the university is producing half-baked graduates. 
So we decided that let us have a, a unit that will connect us with the world. And then, because we are told that we produce half-baked students, the Outreach Center has a unit that is carrying out incubations. We started with agribusiness incubations. But this is open to all other areas, including ICT and the rest, so that we can have graduates who are ready to work. If they are not ready to work, in an employment situation, they can also be employers. They can start their own businesses. We started this and we managed to get uh, funding from the African Development Bank through Enable Youth Project. And we have three agricultural value chains that we are already incubating in. That is dairy. We chose dairy because this is a dairy place. Um, mushroom and aquaculture and fisheries. We have already trained about 32 incubators in phase one. And this is a project that has, is going to have four cycles. That is cycle one. We are going to have four cycles. So we still have another three. And uh, when we were reviewing the program recently, we informed the team that we can expand the value chains. You had the DVC talk about UngaPAP. That is a program that has developed from the serial value chain. So we want to bring that in. Then we have pigs in this university and we have poultry. So we want to increase the number of value chains. But we are also opening this up so that it is not just agribusinesses that we are incubating. Having said that, I want to step outside the university and look at what we are talking about from the outside. I have a problem in that looks like everybody wants to do incubation. The county government is establishing Eldo Hub to do incubation. My bankers here, <laughs> I bank with ABSA. These guys are my friends. They know me, I put all my money in their pockets and they are good, they are taking care of it. It's not much money, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard that ABSA has a program they are calling Ready to Work, which is basically an incubation program. So if the university has an, in, an incubation program, the county has an incubation program, the bank has an incubation program, are we complementing each other or are we fighting? Or rather competing? And is that healthy? Um, we started this incubation center here and our biggest weakness is funding. We have equipment, we have expertise, we have data, we can do a lot. All that we lack is funding. How can we, how can we partner? How can we collaborate? How can we synergize so that I think in this country we have a lot of problem and you later mentioned that when a new government comes in Nandi, they'll forget what you later and team have been doing and they start afresh. We end up not really making progress. 
Can we build onto what there is so that we can grow? So I'm asking, how can we partner and collaborate so that we can move forward together? Because the elder hub may not have equipment. They may not have expertise. And if they are the people who are at our gate here, I've told them, can they come in <laughs> so that we can collaborate and move forward? Um, the banks, and I've noticed that all the banks today have a foundation or a program that is funding youths and women. Of course, they don't care about men, but you are the one who are taking care of those youth and the, and the women. <laughs> uh, this group is a group that does not have collateral. So if you say that you are incubating the youth and then you'll give them money, I'm sure you are aware that this, this is a group that does not have collateral. In our program with the the African Development Bank, the Enable Bank, the Enable uh, Project, that is one issue that we had to really discuss for days because this program, we are the trainers and the incubators. The Ministry of Agriculture are the implementers of the project and the, and, uh, the bank is giving the money. Now, that money is being uh, managed by the AFC. The AFC has been giving loans to farmers for ages. But they give loans to farmers who have collateral. So they are the ones who have been given money to give to these youths who don't have collateral. So we have a very serious discussion with them what collateral shall we have with these youths? So we agreed that if we train these youths properly and incubate them properly, and the bank can see through them and accept that these youths will be productive and that the money they are given, they will be able to pay back, that is collateral enough. So it is kind of intellectual property kind of collateral. I don't know what ABSA is doing, how they are giving the youth money and ensuring that that will be paid. So those are my two questions. Sorry, I took long. I needed to lay that base. Can we have four or so questions fired from the floor? Yes. Loretti University is the host, our guest, and the audience at large. Allow me to salute you. Good afternoon. I am privileged to share the uh, same podium with my deputy governor, Dr. Yulita. Thank you. My question goes directly to Kenya seat. I want to believe our seats have been subjected to various innovations through the evolution of our seats, right? Which is basically the output of our innovations. But allow me to ask whether these innovations which has been subjected to our seats in line with a climatic change that has been realized. Yes? I, there is this giant which is being termed as GMO. Is this output of it our innovations with respect to our health assets which also does not uh, interfere with our health. So that we don't come up with an innovation which in the, in the long run would, may affect ourselves through our own innovations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, my question, I have two questions. Uh, the first one uh, is to APSA and uh, I want to see equity in the program. And uh, uh, Please, could you talk to uh, the issue of profitability? 
uh, CSR and uh, innovation. Uh, because uh, when we look at innovation, especially when it comes to funding, probably uh, from your perspective, it would only be a CSR activity and then uh, how it eats up uh, into your profitability. And then uh, number two uh, is uh, to the uh, High Excellency, the DG. Uh, we are looking at uh, uh, the policy uh, in terms of uh, funding, especially for research and innovation. And we're also looking at CSR. And uh, uh, maybe we could look at, at it in terms of what is happening right now uh, in Kericho County and uh, probably also affecting Nandi. So as we look at our partnership uh, with the private sector, uh, what is uh, the policy uh, in terms of CSR uh, for our private sector, even as they make uh, the billions in profits? Thank you. Just before you, you give the mic, kindly introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Yeah. I'm Kamimo Simeon, a School of Environmental Studies. Thank you. Can Any other? another question? Just one more first, and then we'll come back one. to the next round. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. My name is Paul Kamau from RBTTI. I'm quite impressed with the idea of organization absorbing the innovators. But my question is, what steps are being taken to protect the idea of this innovator? Or the innovator has to protect the idea before giving it to the organization? Thank you. Can we take uh, one more? There was a lady next to yes. me. Yeah, and then we will come back. Yes. Let's just take this first question so that we don't forget. Yeah, thank you. My name is Seraphine from the University of Eldoret. I've heard you talk about innovations, and your talk is more of things to do with maybe computer skills, agriculture. And um, I'm concerned about these innovators in the arts, those who market products through poetry and dance and music, and I'm wondering, what space do you have for such kind of innovators? And how are you planning to accommodate such kind of innovators? Because there are so many, there are those who also draw, mm. but we've not had them getting accommodated somewhere. So maybe you could explain to us how you can take care of such. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we'll just take those questions first, and then we'll come back. I think Magdalene will take the first question. Then we have two questions for Absa, there's one for uh, Kenya C directly, and I think I don't mind taking the IP as well as the, uh, then the, the DG can take the question on the arts, and the rest can also contribute. Yeah, go ahead. If we can also be brief when we answer so that we can take as a few more questions. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think uh, there is a, a bit of uh, duplication of efforts. Uh, you have the University of Eldoret with their incubation center. Um, maybe I need to know more about it. And then we have APSA talking about uh, mentorship and incubation. We also have Eldohub. And uh, just to also clarify, Eldohub is not owned by the government. It is a, pri it's a, a, a private entity. So I think there is, that also brings in the um, partnership between the academia, the private sector, the government, and ETCTC. But then my point would be, uh, how can we collaborate together and see ways in which maybe we can match efforts to see how we can uh, better, maybe even build a better capacity to continue supporting the innovators. And uh, for us, I think we have experience working with different uh, entrepreneurs across the country in terms of incubation, including even funding. We fund them through uh, some of the partners that we have. And uh, currently we have funded over 300 across the country in 40 counties where we identify them, we provide them mentorship and coaching, and then we incubate them, and then we recommend some of them to our partners for funding. So we have one uh, partner that's GIZ who actually give them funding. But then after they've gone through uh, a certain 
uh, criteria. So there is um, synergies there. There is something that it's surely we really need to sit down and see ways in which, uh, uh, of course, University of Eldoret as the academia, us, Eldo Hub, and the banking institution, how can we work to uh, come up with a, a, a one program? And of course, there is Innovate UK that can facilitate the process. I hope I'm not speaking on your behalf. And, uh, but then, uh, of course, with your place-based innovation, there is a way which in which we can actually come together and see how we can uh, strengthen that program. And also, we've been running as well a North Rift Innovation Week. Uh, we started on Monday last week, and the Deputy Governor closed it on Thursday. And uh, we had three innovators being given um, uh, 300,000 uh, Kenya shillings just to continue supporting their innovation going forward. And some of the partners that we had include uh, Innovate UK, UNDP, uh, Seagull Family Foundation, Safaricom, Huawei, among other partners. So also maybe that's something that we can see to match the innovation week. We are not saying uh, to separately run them, but then we can uh, be running within the same week and then we close it with a very big event that can really be, uh, can showcase innovation in this region. I think those are some of the things to think about and we really need another meeting and hopefully the banking institution and the county government can come in. And I'm happy, ours is North Rift. We can also make it, it can be, you've talked about NOREP and what you are doing. So the North Rift kind of covers the entire region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I th I th those are very, very good questions. Just to bring, uh, I, I think there was one very good question from the university about what we are doing as a bank to support youth with brilliant ideas. They will want to get some facilities and they might not be having collateral. So uh, as, as a bank, we have uh, facilities that do not require collateral. What, what this program that we have with uh, the youth, we are calling it ready to work program, is that we, we incubate the young entrepreneurs and we take them through a program that runs for 18 months. At the end of the 18 months, you can qualify for unsecured lending of up to 10 million, depending on the idea and how well we have been able to invest and seen that we have empowered you. So some of the things that we do through the entrepreneurial skills set is that we give you some basic skills on financial management, preparing a budget, how to work with uh, uh, some, uh, how, how to do basic bookkeeping and stuff of that nature. Then the other one is the soft skills on people management, how you relate with the people, because business is about relating with others. So we empower you from a relationship management perspective to relate with others, to have that emotional intelligence to know how to relate with others, to create those networks. And through those networks, now you can be able to build your, your networks. Then we also help you to connect with the markets. So that's a critical uh, part that we do. And of course, we work with the county governments we work with other private sector industry players to open up the space for you so that you can have a wider space. We organize international trips for our business customers and the young innovators get an opportunity to go out there and see how other, uh, other business people in other countries are able to, to do it. So that exposure is part and parcel of the package that we're giving you so that we take you through the ready, ready to work program we upskill you through mentorship. We connect you to, attach you to a mentor. We monitor the progress from one level to the other. And by the end of the 18 months, we are comfortable and confident that you can be able to manage the resources that we are giving you. And it depends on the idea. Some ideas require as little as maybe 200, 300,000 to actualize. Others might be requiring much more. And that's why we are saying we can give up to 10 million unsecured. So those. Th those, uh, uh, th some of that is, is available from our end. Then to answer Mr. Haminua, uh, I don't know whether it's Mr. Haminua or Dr. Haminua, I didn't get the first, the title, but Haminua Simeon, 
uh, he wanted to know about some of the CSR activities or how we are applying back to the community that is helping us to make the profits that we do. Uh, some of the initiatives we are running, and it is tapping into the innovation, is that currently we are partnering with schools. Uh, that is uh, Computer for Schools Kenya. We have partnered with Computer for Schools Kenya, and we are donating computer labs to, uh, and I I of the 84 branches that we have in the country, each branch of APSA Bank has adopted at least one, insti one needy institution where we are setting up a computer lab. The reason why we are passionate about setting up computer labs is because for us to be able to nurture the talent for the young people to be innovative as we move forward is that we need to start at primary school level, secondary school level, to train them and make expose them to computers. That way they will be able to appreciate what's happening elsewhere through the internet because we are living in a global village and you can only learn that through internet. So we are doing that uh, currently. We have uh, done at least one institution in each of our counties and that's a program that's ongoing. We are also doing big on climate change. You realize that uh, there is a lot of challenge from that space, food, security and stuff. So currently we are planting trees and we have committed to plant 10 million trees in the next five years, two, two million every year. And we are partnering with institutions and one of which will of course be University of Eldora to see how we can work together. So that's another initiative from a CSR perspective. We are giving back to the, so, so to the community that's giving us business. And then we are also big from a sporting perspective. We nurture talent and we work closely with some of our talented uh, sports uh, men and women. Uh, we sponsor a number of international uh, 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 sporting activities like English Premier League. Locally here, we partner, we sponsor Kenya Open, the golf uh, events. And for, uh, next year, we are looking at devolving some of those engagements so that we, we do a lot of sporting activities locally. So we have a lot of initiatives that are local, we are going local and we want to be part and parcel of the engagements and be part and parcel of the society to see how best we can support uh, the society. Uh, Paul Kamau, RVTTI, uh, was asking about uh, how, w w I don't know whether it was Paul or someone else who was asking whether we are also tapping into some of the talents, especially our artists. What I can tell you is that in our ready to work program, we partner with talented artists, uh, some of which is uh, Saudi Soul. So, and I know we've had ready to work program here. In 2020, I, I came here with uh, a team and we were running ready to work program uh, with the University of Eldoret and uh, a number of university students that gathered here. We, were, we, we are adopting some of the the who is who in from a talent perspective so that they can inspire our young people to know that if you can pursue your talent, it can take you so far. So we are working with uh, talented uh, young people and we are also adopting some of the local talents in our spaces so that we see how we can uh, give them that forum to be able to nurture their talent. So uh, to answer you directly, we are working with all talented youth to be able to help them nurture their talent. Thank you. Can you see it? Oh, sorry. Uh, you can take the question. Thank you. Um, GMO has been a subject that has been dominating our conversation as a country in the recent past, uh, both in the social media and all platforms and forums. Guys have been coming up with opinions. Others are backed, are not backed by science, you know. Um, from where we see it as an organization, um, this is a, it's a government parastatal, and uh, we have been a non-GMO organization, non-GMO. Our research operations have been uh, conventional, our breeding, sorry, uh, operations have been conventional, and uh, that is natural selection and breeding. And uh, we, the recent uh, approval 
of uh, GMO, uh, bit turned tables. And uh, yeah, conversation are still going on. And, uh, but at the moment, we do not have any GMO material. We all have non-GMO materials. And uh, we are looking at it because we are government and we have to move with the government. We will um, consult further. We're looking at what the government will be able to offer in terms of policy and regulations on how these materials are going to be handled and how we are going to progress from where we are. Uh, but uh, we have in-house conversations and uh, We'll still maintain our GMO material, non-GMO materials, but at the same time, heed to the government's directive of acquiring GMO materials, but we will, we will move progressively. First of all, looking at the policy in place, looking at uh, the regulations in place, we may be guided by that. We may have one or two of those materials, and then the farmers will be able to have you know, their own choices. It's about tests and preference. So if they go for GMO, we will we'll see how it goes about. If they choose to move with the current conventional uh, non-GMO materials that we have, we are, we are okay. About the safety, yeah, it's still a conversation that still goes around. And uh, yeah, it's still not proven still not really clear and uh, I will not be able to to allude to many of these things that are going on but I will only say that as a position the, the organization we will move with the government uh, the directive that we are given will move with it but we will still maintain our non-GMO material so we, we ask us to be patient and uh, wait for clear uh, information that is really backed by science in terms of health. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that answer. Um, there was a question around the creative industry and those in the creative industry, where do they fall, Madam DG? Where do they fall? Do they have a space um, in this conversation? Uh, what is the plan that we have for our young people who are in the creative economy? Thank you so much. Um, I'm aware that among the focus areas for the Kenya Kwanzaa government is to support the creatives. It may uh, still take a bit of time because this is probably a sector that was not uh, given preeminence in the past, but I'm aware that that conversation is on. I remember when we came into office the first term in 2017, as a county government, we had identified that as a priority and we wanted to uh, construct and equip a studio. But then because the understanding of our mem uh, county assembly members was had not reached there, they shut it down. And when it shut down, you ca they will not fund. And for us as executive, we cannot, you cannot implement a budget without the support of the county assembly. So really this is, this is uh, a subject that I think um, time has come for us to have an honest conversation and avail a platform. I'm aware of a place in, in Nairobi that already has provided a space, they are calling it DigiLab, mm -hmm. where um, people in the creatives come together to share their ideas and to challenge each other to develop and, uh, and bring it up. But as we speak, we don't have one in the region yet. So uh, yes, it is a, a genuine concern and we cannot run away from it. All of us really uh, enjoy creative work and therefore uh, we have to just be intentional about providing a platform for the development of the creatives. Now there was also another question about uh, CSR policies and what have you. Yes, I think for every um, for every institution, there will always be a CSR policy. But again, uh, not everybody is genuine about uh, offering CSR. Sometimes it's not about genuinity, genuinity as, as such, 
but sometimes pr other priorities supersede and uh, organizations are not able to conduct CSR. But then this is what one way of giving back to the community. Conducting CSR activities is one way of giving back. It's one way of linking to the community and uh, being able to, to benefit the people who support your business or who support your, your enterprise. Uh, we have had challenges in Nandi County with um, our entrepreneurs in the tea sector who for some reason have done little or nothing uh, to support um, the citizens, to support the government. For the five years we were in office from 2017 to 2022, uh, the guys in the tea sector even denied us cess, which is a right. They collect cess from farmers, but they have refused to give it to us. When we demand, they go to court. And this country has become too litigious. You now hear, even when we want to have that conversation about GMO, you can't do it now because somebody has gone to court. Yeah. So that as much as we, we, have, we are blessed to have a new progressive constitution, I think sometimes we overdo things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was a question on, on protection of uh, ideas. So there are a number of ways you can protect your idea. And ideas have to be protected by owners of the idea. So you as an individual, especially to the students, it's on your plate for you to be able to do this. And I've worked with the uh, entrepreneurs across this continent for the past 13 years. And I get this question every single time that I meet with, with innovators. And you ask them, do you know any types of protection other than a patent? And most of them don't. They think that's the only way you can protect your idea. It's not. Uh, secondly, um, the time it takes for you to get a patent sometimes will be a hindrance for you to progress. Yes, you can, you can apply for it, um, and you can even apply, apply for an, an industrial design uh, from Kipi, for instance. Uh, but the time it will take you for, for you to have the patent, and then the time period that the patent will protect you with, because it has an expiry date, I think it's 20 years. After 20 years, it's fair game. So even though I, I get it, I get the importance of protecting the ideas, it's also important for you to educate yourself on what are the available avenues for you to protect your idea, one. Two, which one will be the best protection measure for you as an innovator to use immediately for you to move as fast as possible, especially in this world where we live in, where things move extremely fast. For you, for that 18 months that you're waiting to hear from Kipi, what has happened within that 18 months? You think people who are in that industry will have just waited, and you can make some very little iteration to this initial idea and have it and own it. So I, I think institutions, of course, have you know, I think they have IP offices that can guide you on these issues. But secondly, as an innovator, it must be on your plate to understand what will protect your idea first and then go for that. So I think it's a two-way, yes? The institution can protect you. The organizations you work with, uh, you know, private sector or whatever, can also try to, but I mean, it's not really in their interest, to be very fair and frank with you. It's more in your interest for you to be able to protect so that you can reap from the knowledge that you've, you've deployed. So if you're an innovator working on, on something, go to the IP office. If not, please read online. These things are everywhere. Not WhatsApp and Facebook all the time. Let's read about these things, especially to young Kenyans who are working on, on innovative solutions. You guys are brilliant, but on this front, you you relax the, the rope a little bit. So to the innovators, that's a challenge to you. Yeah. We can take the other questions. Okay, my name is Max Kusimba, student at RVTTI, Technical Training Institute. I take diploma in automotive engineering. So my question is, as a institution, 
we have invented machines and projects which are community solving problem. But as you finish your course and you go out there, you search a place where you can deliver your skills and creativity, mm. like in a company. As you go there, they ask you that this job, you are supposed to have five years experience. How will you assist such a student who has skills and creative but does not have five years experience? Secondly, as from the genesis, we know that fuel is an unrenewable source of energy, mm. isn't it? So as, as a technical institution, we try to come up with uh, an electric vehicles to do away with fuel, where we wanted to overcome a Tesla as a technical institution. But we are, as we requested for the gadgets for invention of that auto electric vehicle, it was too expensive. So it forced us to come up with a prototype. So my question is, how will you assist such a young innovators to get connected like in Toyota Kenya, which deals with the vehicle so that you can deliver your skills d d there and meet, and meet young mentors and integrate their mind together so that we can come up with that project to do away with using of the fuel, fuel because we know that fuel sometimes normally pollutes the environment. So we want to solve that problem. How will you assist such a young innovators? Thank you. Yeah. Please raise your hand up like this so that we can see you because you can't see some of your hands that are down. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for uh, what I've had since I came. Uh, I came a bit late, so probably even what I want to ask has, has already been... Uh, uh, an answer has been given to it uh, earlier. Uh, my name is Professor Tieno, uh, Department of Biological Sciences. Uh, now the innovation hubs like Eldo Hub and APSA and others, you, you take on these projects, you incubate them for some time, and then they go out into the, into the market. Uh, I'm just wondering, what is the success rate of uh, the projects that you have incubated? And uh, have you been following up on them to, to really find out, yes, we help these people uh, come up with these ideas and incubate, incubated them for some time, but now how are they doing out there? So uh, what's the success rate? That's, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Thank you. Through the chair, our sponsors, and the University of Eldred, my name is Muga Moses, School of Agriculture and Biotechnology Department of Seed, Crop, and Horticulture Science. As an innovator, being guided with the vision on of University of Eldoret to be a premier university that is globally visible in knowledge generation and technologically innovation. I have a question. Need of markets and collaboration. Through our county governments, TVETs, University of Eldoret and banks. As an innovator with a cutting edge technology, after the technology is ripe, in business they say maximize profit and minimize cost. I would like us to collaborate. I'd like us to maximize the little ideas that we have so that we can market outside there through our banks and make maximum profit. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. 
I'm Obari Isaiah from RVTTI. I'm actually a, uh, a product of this university. <laughs> so my question goes to the University of Eldred. I've heard that uh, you want to start a degree, uh, a BSc in innovation. And uh, I want to put my question around that area. So according to my understanding about innovation, for you to reach a point where you are innovating something, you kind of need to have some broad knowledge in that particular area. And uh, having a course or a degree program in an area like that would require uh, vast knowledge in maybe in varieties of degree programs or in varieties of areas. Now, uh, my question is, uh, I'm, I'm actually wondering whether that uh, degree program will actually stand on its own, or would it be better if maybe it can be split into uh, units and be incorporated in all other degree programs so that uh, it can inspire innovations in all other degree programs. And again, I would also want you, in your response, try and uh, differentiate it from entrepreneurship. Thank you. Uh, there were four questions. I think uh, you can answer the ones that you think uh, okay. are appropriate. We can start from you going. Yeah. Oh, you, you later. You. Th thank okay. you. I'd, I'd like to go first and take on the question that was raised about markets. Um, we'll go back to part of what we started off earlier that there's a lot of data, but that data is not collated. For instance, today, even when we are talking about um, government asking farmers to sell their maize, they are not saying sell to who. Yeah. And even those who need to buy, they don't know where that maize is. So as we speak right now, we have to be intentional about availing data in a platform where everybody can access from whatever. So that we know that there is farmer X and farmer Y in region A and region Z who has this amount of maize, this amount of beans. <coughs> there is trader C who needs and that trader C can pick either A or Y for that product. So sometimes we, we struggle. You find in the past we've had regions pouring out their milk. As we speak right now, we are told we have a deficit of around 6 million liters per day of milk. Right? Yeah. And even right now, by the way, even, even when... Um, Brookside is offering between 42 to 50 shillings per liter. Farmers out there are, sell, are hooking milk at 60 shillings or 80. So tell me, will that farmer take milk to Brookside or to KCC at a price that doesn't, mm -hmm. is, is, not, is, not, uh, is not enabling him or her to break even? So until we are co-intentional as a country, to operate on data that is available, that is collected, that can be analyzed to help in decision making. We will continue complaining about markets. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just maybe to pick on uh, where uh, Excellency mentioned, I think uh, one of the things, I don't know if you've heard about uh, product market fit. As an innovator, first of all, you really need to understand, you know, the, the the market that you want to serve, and that is where you sort out the issue of market needs. Because if you design your product that is needed in the market, then you will know where the market is. And um, I think um, as this is something that we really need 
to understand as the innovators. What is the problem that we are solving? You know, what is the data that are available? And when you come up with those prototypes, that minimal viable product of yours, the first thing you need to do is to test the assumption. When you are starting something, if I am manufacturing this water, you know, I think, I'm just thinking in my mind, hey, this is something that I will make a lot of money. But it's, some, it's an assumption. I need to go out there to the real uh, users or the people that I think are the, are going to buy this water so that they, I test that assumptions. Once I have tested and confirmed that, then it really becomes easier to develop a product market fit. I think that's the most important thing. And after you have the product market fit, collaboration and other things comes in. And um, that was just a follow up. I want to answer the questions on skills with no experience. And uh, of course, um, you, you've said that um, uh, when you are applying for jobs, there is a five years experience and maybe you are in an entry level job, right? Yeah, I think one of the things that you really need to understand is um, when you are applying for a job, first of all, it's not a must that you tick all the boxes. Even if they say five years and you feel that you can actually explain how you are going to counter those, the inexperience that you have, because you don't know who else applied. You know, you just need, you don't, um, I don't know, you don't uh, remove yourself from the competition. You just need to try and try as much as possible. That is one. Secondly, you need to look also for entry level opportunities like apprenticeship program that you're going to build uh, um, experience through those. Sometimes you volunteer just to make sure that you get experience. And did you know that it's really easy to get a job when you have another job? So I think um, try as much as possible to look for that experience. And uh, don't, you know, sometimes just, you know, you don't want to, people say they don't want to do jobs without pay. But sometimes that is the experience that you need. So look at those. And then also to uh, success rate of the project incubated. That's uh, from Professor Otieno. Um, for us, uh, one of the things, first, before I answer that question is, we really need innovation and a startup. You know, the definition of a startup is it's an experiment. So a startup is not a business. First of all, it's an experiment. So you try if it is going to work. If it doesn't work, then you keep iterating until you have a product market fit. So, um, so it's really good also if we don't have, um, if we have, uh, unsuccessful uh, startups and uh, um, I've gotten an opportunity to go to Silicon Valley and uh, I went to Google X. Google X is um, it's a program within Google that they invite innovators just to try things and they were telling us that 90% uh, of the ideas actually fail. Okay. Sorry, the DG wants to leave. She has to rush, rush somewhere. So, Madam, just come and say bye. <laughs> Don't leave us without talking. I know. <laughs> uh, you understand she has another assignment, so please uh, just bear with us. UOE, I love you. This is where I was baked and I'm trying very hard not to let you down where I am. And I want to thank you, uh, Bonadivisi DVC and your team for inviting me. I have picked and I have learned a lot from this conversation. I wish I could stay longer, but I have another assignment. I have a meeting in Nakuru at five. And this is the kind of space we have gotten into. I was up by four. We had a cabinet meeting at six. Yes, it can be very stressful, but uh, the fulfilling bit is when you are touching lives and you're causing impact. So I will come back another time. Thank you so much and God bless you. Uh, the DG as you go, 
let me just remind you that your ICT team came and linked up with us because of data that you are talking about. But because of COVID, we slackened a little bit. So could you urge them to come back? We are ready. Thank you. Uh, can, we, can we continue? Um, have all of you reacted to the questions? Did Kenya Seed have something to say? No? Uh, can we pick another two questions only? Then I think we can wrap up. Please. If there is, if there isn't, there is if the questions here. have been asked there and answered, please don't ask. There is one here. Only one. Any other? Only one. Okay. We then I'll one. we'll hand over to the moderator to finish up. Right? Thank you. And you respond to the UAE question. Yes, the DVC is coming back. Okay, to thank you. I'm Kip Toenok from RVTTI. Okay, we've had very extensive innovations as youths, but the innovations end up disappearing. So, the lady there has, has explained how the innovations can be protected by our own selves. But how is the government going to protect these innovations from the innovators themselves? Thank you. Would you like to elaborate or you are okay? He's asking about innovations that are disappearing. So, a bit more context to be with this group. Disappearing in what sense? They are not okay. Uh, is it that the innovators stop working on those innovations? Is it that somebody else takes those innovations? Is it, it disappear in what sense? Or they are being stolen? <laughs> okay, I can explain in this time. There was a time. Uh, a young man in Migori innovated a, a chopper using locally made materials. So the, ma the man, after coming up, coming up with the project, it just went and disappeared. <laughs> and it, the man was not empowered to go and do more. So my question is, how is those people, a man like that who have used the locally made materials, going to be empowered to come up with something more, more of that? Thank you. Maybe now we request responses. The hub might answer that. <laughs> Could be a question of maybe funding or lack of mentors, et cetera, et cetera, but. Yeah, I, I really think that um, there is a need for more collaboration to support such kind of innovations. And uh, I'm currently the chairperson of the Association of Countrywide Innovation Hubs, a network which brings together all innovation hubs across the country. And uh, I think uh, one of the things when we started is we were looking at there is a lot of concentration of innovations in the capital city, which is Nairobi. And then the other areas, there were no innovation hubs to actually support such kind of uh, innovators to bring their ideas to life. So currently we have uh, 70 uh, innovation hubs uh, across the country and our focus is outside Nairobi. So if you go to Kisumu, you will find Lake Hub, you'll find uh, Fab Lab, and uh, you'll find uh, Wise Hub, Winam Capital. If we come to Rift Valley, we have Eldo Hub, we have uh, Tumaini Innovation Centers, even Garissa and all the others. So across the country, we have these innovation hubs that can actually support you. You just need to know where they are 
you just need to walk into those offices and see and ask them how they can you know better support to bring those ideas to life if they are, don't have the capacity to support you they will definitely link you to someone who has the capacity to be able to support you and in terms of uh, protecting your idea I think uh, always when you are negotiating with someone, make sure that you have it written, make sure you have MOUs, make sure you utilize the non-disclosure agreements so that you, you don't have someone uh, who has more money and more capacity implementing your idea. And of course we have Kipi and the rest, of which Sheila had already discussed more on, you know, how, um, you know, you need to also to evaluate, you know, that time of waiting for the, for Kipi to respond, the money that is needed, do you even have that, is it 30,000, I don't know, to actually uh, work on your idea, to actually uh, patent etc. Et but then uh, there are small wins that you can work on to actually bring your idea to life as you work on the other things. Because you might end up using a lot of money and, and then you realize that uh, your idea is not working. Like I said, a startup is an experiment. You are trying to see whether you can build a business out of it. So uh, you need to really evaluate so many things. And one thing that I would like to leave you with is always fail very fast and fail cheap. Yeah, failing cheap means you don't have to use a lot of money to actually validate your idea. So by the time you start putting in a lot of money, you, you, you need to have gotten, um, you, have, you have validated in the market. So that's one of the things. But please, uh, to everyone, try to connect with the different innovation hubs across the country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'll call the DBC to come and answer the, the question about the, the degree program in innovation and uh, then give his closing remarks. Thanks. I thought we have educationists here like Professor Kita Inge. <laughs> but maybe before he comes, I think uh, this is not a narrow degree like the degree in innovation, no. And the way it's, it's being developed, it involves all the sectors, but centered from the school of business. So this will be business will be coming in. It will involve even all the other areas. So it's something that is in the process like what is being done at, uh, I don't know whether you know what is being done at JQuart. It is, uh, JQuart, they call it what? It's, it's a very long name. Bachelor of Science in Technology Innovation something? Yes, it's a long thing. But then it involves everything because it has to be something that is going to be a cross, a cross cutting issue, a cross cutting kind of course that will enable. But when I talked, I talked at different levels. There's one level that there's one course which will be cutting across in first year or second year. Then there is this one which will be a course that people who are now interested in that line and then they will be at a, a master's level. So this is something that is a work in progress and be assured that in the development of these courses, it will not go without criticism and it's a long process. Like right now, we have a commission for university education here with us for some courses we developed several years ago. So it has to go through several approval process. So be assured that it's not something that's going to be narrow. I think that's what I can say in terms of that. And uh, Sheila, I mean, I'm being told to close, but I've not heard from you. <laughs> you are the one who was uh, moderating, so maybe yeah. you can say something before. Yes. Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much for attending this session. Uh, it's been quite insightful to get the, the questions. Um, but I think more importantly, uh, forums like this are meant to create those platforms for discussion. And even more importantly for networking. And I'd like that before we leave this session, we get to know at least one other person. And so I will ask, in the roles that we are, we, I don't know how we can do it. Um, I don't know, in circles or you get to interact with at least four people. If you'll go this way or that way, you have to know someone today. So say what you can give, so your skill. Who was asking about uh, getting experience? Pitch, pitch yourself. What, what is your name? You're coming from 
which institution, what are you studying, what would you want, and what can you get from somebody else, not with your friends. So if you're sitting four of you from the same class, I know those ones who are smiling there, you are not allowed to be in the same group. <laughs> in the, I am also a lecturer, by the way, so <laughs> you're, not, you're not allowed to, to be in the same group. Um, as Innovate UK, we really, really value knowledge transfer. And I've had a lot of people talking about what are some of the opportunities for funding, for instance, for collaboration. The UK government is, is keen on that. Unfortunately, we don't have as much research funding in Kenya. We do, but it's, it's not as, you know, as you would, for instance, to support like that innovator. I mean, you would require a lot of funding. Forget even the, the mentorship bit. Funding for components alone, uh, for that, I think, is, is significant. And those components are, ch are charged, so there's tax to it as well. Bringing them in requires a lot of, um, of uh, processes as well, so which takes time. So anyway, um, I think look for those opportunities beyond Kenya. We have a lot of, if you can check Innovate UK, um, a website or UK RI, UK Research and Innovation Funding. There are a lot of opportunities in, in energy, in agriculture, social sciences, in the creative economy, that they have collaborative R&D opportunities for people. Collaborative R&D means an institution, for instance, RBTTI RV, can work with the University of Eldoret and University of Liverpool um, on research that you're working on or whatever um, in, in the energy sector, in whichever sector, look for those opportunities because they give you a grant that will allow you to research and develop the product, then it's easy for you to commercialize because at that point, you already have the product. Sometimes it's easy to put the money in because then you're not sure if it will work or not. And industry also, to be very honest with you, they rarely invest in R&D earlier on because it's very high risk. If I'm bringing someone into my, my company and we do 15 tons a day and we want to test a component that could shut down 15 tons a day, they will not give you that opportunity. So looking for those types of funding that allow you to be able to do that is important. Thank you so much for coming here. I hope we had a sign up sheet um, that uh, you've put your emails. If not, we can, I don't know how we can get that so that I can send you some of these opportunities for, for collaboration, for funding, and looking at the other sectors as well that you can learn some things from. Uh, there are even people who look for scholarships for, for some of the research that they do. So if we could get the contacts, I will be able to share those opportunities with you. So maybe make sure before you leave, you sign up somewhere. You can give a paper, just give us your name. There's a paper that's moving around. Yeah, please, just put, yeah, put your name and institution and the email. Uh, then we can, we can share those uh, opportunities with you. Thank you, so I'd like for us to network because I know Kenyans are very shy. We will just talk to our friends, so today I'll force you, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that the next time you, you go to an event, you make sure you know one person. And it's, I've even told you the questions. I mean, it's hard to start a conversation when you don't know what to say, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so now you know what to say. You say your name, which institution you're from, if you're studying or if you're a lecturer, and then what are you looking for? It could be, you know, I'm looking for internship opportunities. And what can you give? So what you, what you can give is, I am studying mechanical engineering at the moment. I've been working on this. So if you know people in that industry, I'm the go-to guy. I've even given you a leakage. I mean, come on. <laughs> come on. So, so I don't know. Uh, should we do it in a... Because the way you are seated like this, I am very skeptical that you know each other. So we'll do it this way. If we, can we stand? Is it okay for us to stand and form circles? We've been sitting for long. Come on, please, please. Yeah, let's form circles. And go around. So yeah, you can have, yeah, two rows. In fact, it can be easy. So face the other, the, the ones in front, face the ones behind. No, these ones, no, then the other ones face the other ones. Make sure you face the other row. You face this one. I uh, know the third one face the fourth. The third row face the. So the first row, 
Ah uh ah, -uh. everyone is facing behind. Look at me. Look at me. <laughs> Look at me. So the first and second face the third row. So this you just turn. You turn turn to the next row. Then the guy was asking about patent, your row turns to the fourth row. Yes. Yes. And then uh uh you don't turn, face him. Then the other row behind you face the other row. Yes, uh uh, you have to turn. Please, for you, move move close to the other one so that you make sure you are talking to somebody. Make sure you are talking to somebody. So row number one. Yes. Is the one to turn. Yes. Row number two does There's not no turn. turn, yes. Number three, you turn, number four doesn't turn. Yes. Five, you turn, six doesn't turn. So, uh, those two are friends. Stop talking to each other. I can see you. <laughs> Kenyans don't like to do that. They don't. They go to events and only talk to the people they came to the event with. Can you get that? Can you get that? Please, the information went.